Hey, Keto Freaks. In case you haven't heard, Richard Morris and I are turning the entire town of New London, Connecticut, ketogenic in July 2017. Keto Fest isn't a conference. Conferences are for professionals. Festivals are for people. We will have some great speakers, yes, but also a pig roast, music, movies, cooking lessons, fitness lessons, bike tours, walking tours, and a whole lot of camaraderie among fellow Ketonians. Richard and I will both be there, as will many of our podcast guests and Facebook group admins. There's so much going on, I don't have time to tell you here. So go to ketofest.com and add your name to the mailing list so you'll know where to go and when in order to get your tickets. Keto Fest, real keto for real people. Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin from Connecticut in the United States. In February 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In just two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. As of now, I'm about 80 pounds lighter with no signs of diabetes or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia, and I've been on a ketogenic diet for over two years. When I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. Within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I've also lost about 80 pounds and I've completely turned my health around. And this show is a document of my progress through ketosis and Richard's experience thriving for years in nutritional ketosis. Yeah. And hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yeah, we're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone any medical advice but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail, are we, Carl? Nah. We've done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind them, and we hope to share some of that research. Where possible, we intend to put links in the show notes to cite research supporting any claims that we make. You'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. Yeah. We love to cook and we love to eat. In every episode, we both share a keto recipe that cannot be ignored. Absolutely. So let's start podcast number 40, Supplements. Sup, dude. We were going to do the (laughs) sup, dude episode before, but it turned into the ketone sup, dude episode. So this is all the non-ketone supplements. Right. So uh, before we start, do we have any corrections or apologies from last week? No, I think we uh, we did pretty well. That was a Thanksgiving show, and uh, we've mm. had lots of uh, comments from that. Everyone seemed to love it. Um, nobody had any problems or errata for us, so I think we're good. Yeah, it's hard to argue with recipes. <laughs> <laughs> a whole show full of them. Yeah. Okay, let's recap what a ketogenic diet is. Yeah, it's 20 grams of carbs or less. It's really only incidental carbohydrates. Right. Protein is going to scale with how much lean body mass that you have. And what we use is 1 to 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram of lean body mass. Um, and then fat to satiety. And it really comes down to we're getting our energy from fat. We're, we're not getting our energy from carbohydrates or from protein. Right. Or as little as little energy as possible, yeah. Right. And it's a little counterintuitive for people who are mm-hmm. just starting that uh, you need to eat fat in order to lose body fat. But yep. that is the truth. Here it is. And if you want to find more about that, go to our first episode where we introduce you to the ketogenic diet from the get-go. Right. Also, we have written a booklet at booklet.2keto.com that sort of describes the whole thing in a nutshell. Yeah. And you can join our Facebook group at fb.2keto.com and we have an FAQ there, up there that gives you also a, a, a brief outline. And we've got lots of people just starting out there um, and lots of people have been doing it for, for years. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's also a good resource. All right. So, Carl, tell me, how was your week? I had a great week, Richard. I spent a lot of time on the left side of my brain writing code. Nice. So my brain expended a lot of energy. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I was uh, doing my pattern of eating just lunch and um, trying to eat as little as possible after that. 
and just with a Carl Franklin cocktail in the evening or two and uh, <laughs> still not drinking. Uh, except I did have some wine on uh, election night. And, uh, yeah. you know, enough said. Enough said about that. That was an interesting week in that regard. But really, the software development was front and center in what I was doing all week and spending nice. a lot of hours. I'm running a, a a code generator, essentially. Yeah, I've seen the early bits of it. It looks good. Yeah, and this is something that a lot of software developers do themselves, you know, to auto, to help automate the processes of doing the 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 plumbing work in any new system that you develop. Yeah. And so, you know, I've done it before with different technologies and now I'm, I'm, I'm doing it with, uh, what, with what I'm currently using. So nice. I don't want to bore you with that, but I'm, <laughs> like I said, my brain needed a lot of energy this, this uh, week and I had very high fat, uh, moderate protein, absolutely no carb, well, salads, yeah. um, eating all week and I feel great. Awesome. Yeah. And I lost a couple pounds. Always good. But, uh, you know, just sort of still hovering around the same. So uh, that's, I'm not worried about the scale anymore. I just, I just want to feel good and make sure that uh, my body's working right. Yeah, I've got to admit, when I, I lost a lot in the first five months, and then I just sort of gained and lost the same five kilos or so for, for quite a long time. And I think my body was get, my body was at the point where it was happy to defend further weight loss because it, it, mm. it really wasn't comfortable getting, getting losing more weight. Yeah. And it was only then when I started uh, doing some more fasting that I really started to uh, to lose more weight. Um, but my bo- my body is quite happy having about 50 pounds of body fat on there and yeah. it turns out that that gives me the ability to do fasted exercise and uh, and these kinds of activities because mm-hmm. uh, you know I can I can run my body on my body fat so it's 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 like running around with an extra tank of fuel it's wonderful yeah it is wonderful mm. well um, I know how your week was, but I would like you to tell everybody else because you had a fascinating week, my friend. I, I did have a good week. Um, you know, I did a, a long extended fast for 10 days about uh, three weeks ago. Yeah. And then for about a week and a half afterwards, I had lower blood glucose by about one millimole than my than my uh, physiological level. So my physiological level is around about five and it was around about four for almost a week and a half. After the fast, which was quite hmm. surprising, wow. um, and I had a lot of I had a lot of protein cravings, which I I I uh, I, I relented. I, I basically gave my body what it was craving, which is how I like to run my life. Mm-hmm. So that was probably my body sort of um, uh, rebuilding all of the protein structures that uh, mm-hmm. that it would have uh, shrunk a little bit during the fasting process. So I was really going through a feast stage, but it was interesting. My blood sugar stayed low for almost a week and a half, and then for about a week and a half, it uh, it's been about one millimole higher than it normally has, and I've been having uh, food cravings, sugar cravings, and and what have you over the past week and a half. But it's just finally settled down. So it seems like that fast that that's my longest fast ever, and I probably won't go back to to that longer fast because it it really had an ongoing. Um, it, it had a, a significant ongoing uh, impact on me. Um, mm. I think I'm probably going to go down to between three and seven day fast. Is, is, I think is really where my my level is going to be. Okay. But the other interesting thing that happened this week is that I went to a, a lecture by Stephen Finney in Sydney. So and that was just today. That was just today. I had breakfast yeah. with Stephen Finney this morning. That's so cool. <laughs> with Dr. Finney. And I had dinner with him and uh, a whole bunch of doctors uh, last night. So. And Stephen Finney, for those who don't know, he and Jeff Volek wrote essentially the ketogenic Bible, which is called The Art and Science of Low-Carbohydrate Living. Absolutely. And I actually have a signed copy in my hand. <laughs> wow. So, uh, which is good because the previous version of it I had on my Kindle. Um, mm. And the problem with Kindle books is you can only really get one author to sign them. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, but so it was a fascinating lecture. I uh, got to meet uh, about 10 listeners of the podcast. So hi, guys. Mm. Uh, great to meet up with you all today. I, I gave you a shout out in our Facebook group for those of you mm-hmm. who are in there. I uh, got wow. to meet Jennifer Elliott, which for the first time ever, she's the dietitian who uh, was kicked out of the Dietitians Association of Australia for recommending uh, low-carb, high-fat diets. 
Wow. Um, so she's fascinating, and, she, and we might hopefully we might hear from her at some at some point on the podcast. And yeah. I lined up a lot of other people interested in uh, joy, uh, coming on the podcast, so that was also good, including Finney. Right? You you talked to him about coming on the show. Yeah, we're speaking about it, so um, we'll we'll see. Yeah, so um, that's great. But the the feature of the day was uh, the lecture by Stephen Finney. And now, if you've ever seen any of his stuff on on YouTube. It was most. It was probably ninety percent of the stuff that you've seen him present before, but about ten percent of it was secret squirrel stuff that I can't talk about because it's uh, it's uh, research that has not yet been published. Or it's, and this it, is the Canadian study he talked about, or was that no? This, that was Tim Noakes. That was Tim Noakes. This is an Indiana study that he's done with uh, Sarah Holberg, and so that's fascinating stuff. And I, I, wow, I I, I, I I can't really talk about that yet. But it's all good news, right? It's all great news, uh, yes, and yeah. it's 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 going to be even more compelling than the Canadian study. Wow! But I, I learned a lot of background stuff about the Canadian study um, mm. and uh, a lot of other things. So, uh, yeah, it was a great day, and I'm 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 still sifting through the information that I got from it. Um, one interesting thing that he mentioned was that he is not a fan of fasting, and he gave a couple of reasons why, and one of them. Is um, electrolytic imbalances for people who eat nothing, eat, eat only water, mm. and part of that has to do with the fact that there, in the eighties there was this fad diet that was developed by a doctor, and it was I, it was a gelatin shot that you had instead of a meal, and uh, and it was basically just protein. Uh, that's all you're eating, and uh, the problem was that it didn't have all of your essential um, nutrients, micronutrients like uh, vitamins and, and minerals, specifically minerals. This diet was known as a ketogenic diet because it was just a little bit of protein so it it uh, it um, caused you to, to to produce nutritional levels of ketosis uh, and so it was known among doctors as a ketogenic diet and it was really quite effective but it, but there were people who had problems with uh, uh, if you if your electrolytes are off you get cramps in your muscles and if you get a cramp in your heart that's extremely dangerous. So yeah. um, there were a lot of people that had uh, uh, problems with this. So um, uh, so it got a really bad reputation. And this was just as uh, Dr. Finney was just, I think he was about t 10 or 15 years into his work in the ketogenic space. And so just as he was starting to, to build up a bit of momentum, all of a sudden this thing came through and just you know, uh, took the legs out of any research funding for ketogenic uh, diets, and so. But it's um, but it's interesting that all of us who fast, and even Dr. Yeah. Fung says, you take a multivitamin when you fast, yeah. and be careful of uh, of salt and electrolytes, and we we talk about that all the time. I don't yeah, think and, any of us here in the Facebook group, um, our seven thousand members, have have fasted without taking um, electrolyte supplements or even done the ketogenic diet without taking electrolyte yeah, supplements. That's true. And in fact, that's going to be the whole subject of our of our conversation today. And we're going to go through a, a list of uh, all the supplements that we have. But anyway, that was my week. I'm still a little bit buzzed about it, as you can tell. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Or as they say down under, you're a little chuffed. I'm, I'm chuffed. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. That's <laughs> great. That's so awesome. All right, let's rock this show starting with a little segment we call Mail. All right, time for mail. Well, this one uh, was posted in our group from Joshua, and he specifically asks of you, Richard. Okay. Richard, I'd like to know your thoughts on MCT powders. MCT stands for medium chain triglyceride. Yeah. Um, you, this is a component of coconut oil, and it's also uh, you can get MCT oil separated by itself. And this is uh, he's asking about the powdered form. Anyone else with knowledge or experience, please chime in. And sure. so it's an open ended question. So, yeah. So, and it's on our Facebook group. If anybody else has any comments, please uh, jump in and, and uh, let us know. But yeah, I approve of uh, medium chain triglycerides in general. Uh, and the reason why is because uh, they're a very fast digesting fat. So they get very quickly straight into your liver and turn into ketones, which is great. Mm. Um, unlike eating ketones, these are making ketones out of fat. So it produces the physiological form of ketones. Um, I like to think of MCTs are uh, to long chain fats like sugar is to starch. A starch is just a, a polymer of 
lots of sugar molecules all put together. And a long chain fat is just a fat with lots of uh, carbon chains. So um, long chain fats are better for long-term satiety and slow release of energy. Uh, but when you need sudden energy or you have a sudden energy deficit that needs to be made up, then short and medium chain fatty acids will get you going quickly. And uh, so basically what happens to long chain fats is that they have a very long, slow process to get around the body. It takes about 30 minutes to to, to get around the body, whereas the short mm. chain and medium chain, they go straight up into the liver and they're being turned into ketones almost immediately. Wow. So I like medium chain tri- triglycerides in general. I think that's a reasonable way to uh, produce quick ketones. And would you rather get your MCT from coconut oil from a natural source than um, something that is processed and extracted? Yeah, I generally use coconut oil for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I'm cheap <laughs> and it's the cheapest form. Uh, and I like the flavor of coconut oil and I quite like the uh, the makeup of, uh, of the different kinds of MCTs that are in there. Mm. And the other thing is that some of the uh, fractionated MCTs um, can be a little bit hard on the stomach, hard to take. Uh, I yeah. find coconut oil is is easy for me to take. The only problem with the coconut oil is if you if it goes down your uh, breathing tube. Oh man, that takes like, like almost an hour to get over that. It's such, oh, such a no. nasty experience. So you need to wow. be careful when you're swallowing it. Make sure it, make sure none of it goes down your your airways. Well, <laughs> I got to tell you, this week when I was doing my work, I had my jar of coconut oil handy. I have one at the studio here yeah. and I also have one at home and any time that I felt hungry but it wasn't you know in within my eating window sure. I'd just take a, a tablespoon just a, a spoon and just eat yeah. it straight out of the uh, jar yeah. and hunger just goes away anytime my extremities got cold yeah. I just took a teaspoon of uh, coconut oil and everything's fine again it's like wonder food yes it is yeah. so the question really was MCT powder though right and I'm not quite sure how they turn an oil into a powder what I do know is in molecular gastronomy um, you can you can use a starch called maltodextrin to yeah. you can do things like turning bacon fat into powder so you can have powdered bacon fat which is <laughs> Awesome. I, mean, I guess. How good is that? <laughs> uh, personally, I wouldn't eat maltodextrin purely because it's uh, it's pretty much a long chain of glucose, and our digestive system is really good at breaking it down into sugar, yeah. into glucoses. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm curious to learn how this company does it. Uh, because if it's not high carb, then I I wouldn't mind using the method in some of my cooking because uh, I mm. quite like the idea of uh, powderizing uh, oils. But I mm. he did uh, Joshua did send us the nutritional details on the back of the pack. And uh, zero net carbs. Zero net carbs. Yeah, and uh, it also ha- he also had the ingredients list, and the ingredients said something about starch, yeah. and that was all. And I, I suspect maybe it's it's possible that they are using maltodextrin, but they're using such a small amount that it's zero point nine 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 yeah. grams of carbs, and so they're allowed to legally say zero carbs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what you can do is you can test by taking a scoop of the stuff. Uh, and oh, t- test your blood sugar, then take, then eat a scoop of the stuff and then test your blood sugar again after 30 minutes, maybe after 60 minutes. And that will tell you if you're turning whatever it is in that into glucose. Uh, because if you get a spike in your blood glucose, you'll know that they've snuck something in there. But for the most part, it's, uh, it, it, it's an entirely reasonable way to, uh, to take, uh, to produce ketones in your body. But, you know, mm. I'm quite happy using uh, coconut oil, and as long as I'd make sure it doesn't go down my windpipe, I'm good. We really haven't talked about resistant starches on the show, Mm, and it it seems like the question about resistant starches comes up over and over and over again in the group. I don't know. What first of all, what's the promise of resistant starches? What do they claim? Sure. Well, there's two kinds of resistant starches. There are starches that we are just not able to metabolize, uh, such as inulin, which is a polymer of fructose molecule. So it's like a, I guess you could think of it, most starches, most amyloses are, are, are uh, long chains of glucose. Well, uh, inulin is long chains of fructose, a, a different mm. kind of monosaccharide. And okay. you find it inulin in Jerusalem artichokes and in quite a few vegetables, actually. It's just a storage form of energy. Mm. Um, they're just storing fructose for over the winter months. But the, um, 
we can't digest it. Our gut biome can digest it, and they turn it into butyrate and into uh, methane. <laughs> so, uh, it's, <laughs> so you get winded. Yeah, Jerusalem farty jokes <laughs> around this house. But an interesting thing that Dr. Finney said today was that a lot of fibre that feeds your gut that converts into butyrate that feeds your colon. Your colon likes these four carbon fats. It hmm. prefers them over any other source of energy. And so if you can feed your gut bacteria these um, resistant starches, uh, then they'll produce butyrate, this four-carbon four um, uh, energy source, and that's hmm. very healthy for your colon. Well, it turns out that uh, a beta-hydroxybutyrate is also a four-carbon um, fat uh, of a kind. Oh. And so for those of us in nutritional ketosis, we we may not need to feed our gut fiber as much because we're uh, producing exactly the right kind of fuel that our colon cells quite like. So wow. that's an interesting thing that he that he mentioned today. Yeah. Well, that makes sense because uh, and did we do a show on fiber yet? I don't think we have. We haven't. We should do a show on fiber because uh, we should. Yeah. That's another thing that comes up in. I had uh, been taking uh, fiber psyllium husk gel caps basically right. for a long, long time. And I noticed that I had, you know, problems if I didn't take it when I wasn't in ketosis, right? Yeah. And I think it was Brenda Zorn that turned me on to a book about, uh, called The Fiber Menace. Yeah. And uh, while the book was, a, I think I mentioned this on a previous show, but while the book seemed a little bit a little too culty for me, like very kind of, mm. you know, fiber is the devil and, you know, for so <laughs> many reasons. And, uh, you know, while it did seem a little over the top, I mean, his basic science was, was pretty good. And, mm. uh, I stopped taking it. And after a couple of days of, uh, constipation, uh, everything just sort of righted itself and I never had any problems since. Do you take a magnesium supplement? I take a multivitamin every day. Right. Yeah. So, because yeah. the interesting, I had the, I had the same thing. I was having psyllium every day because I was, when I first started this, I was terrified that if I reduced the amount of fiber going through my gut, my gut would seize up and not, right. not transit anything. Right. And it, it turns out that uh, your, your gut is able to create. Uh, correct transit for whatever food that you have. You just need to give it time to adapt to it. Mm. And so as I reduced the amount of uh, psyllium that I was supplementing with, uh, I slightly increased the magnesium, which uh, and the magnesium is good for for muscle relaxation. So it helps mm. with the muscles relaxing down the gut. And also uh, it, it upped my water intake. And uh, basically I had a nice soft landing. And so yep. I'm not complaining at all. I don't, I don't supplement with fiber much at all i don't either yeah I, i'll have i'll have like leafy greens and 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 the like yeah but, uh, other than that I, I have a salad every day yeah yeah so so um so that's one kind of resistant starch and the other kind of resistant starch is this theory that if you take uh potatoes and you cook them and then you cool them and then you cook them again or if you just cook them and cool them the theory is that some of that starch is is locked up so that your body can't uh, turn it into glucose and I suspect that I'd certainly like to see some experimentation, more experimentation on it. But I suspect that part of the problem here is that uh, potatoes are highly insulinogenic. And so people are using glucometers to detect, detect whether this is working. And, uh, because potatoes make you produce a lot of insulin, your glucose, basically at the same point that you're getting glucose hitting your system, you're also getting insulin hitting the system and maybe the two cancel each other out. So maybe you don't get mm. as much of a spike because on the insulin in index, potatoes are as, as insulinogenic as Mars bars. They're like wow. the, third, the third most insulinogenic food uh, on the insulin index. So, so there's that as one thing. And the other thing that I suspect is that you only convert you if you are able to lock up these starches so that they can't be digested, so they're curling around each other and they can't be easily cracked open by enzymes. Then it's quite possible that you're only doing that to a, a small percentage. So it might be that your glucose load has gone from 100 percent to 98 percent or 95 percent or something in that range. So yeah, so I, I have a suspicion that people who want to eat potatoes and want to eat rice really like this story. <laughs> You know. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so, there yeah. is the case of 
people who have lost a lot of weight on an all potato diet. Yes. Like Penn Gillette. Yeah, that's right. From Penn and Teller. He lost a hundred pounds eating nothing but potatoes. Yeah. And there was a, some Australian guy who did the same kind of thing on the potato diet. It was a media, a media frenzy about that. The, right. the mechanism that I suspect happens there, it's not because potatoes are magical carbs, but mm. I think I suspect that the mechanism there is that you're not eating any fat in your diet. You're only eating potatoes, so you can't have them with butter. If you have them with butter, the diet doesn't work. Hmm. If you have them without butter, the diet works. And I suspect the reason why is because the pancreas needs some fat to be able to release insulin. It needs just a little bit of fat in there just in the blood to, to, to produce insulin. So what I suspect is happening is the, the body's fat cells release a little bit of fat, the insulin starts cooking and, and energy starts flowing into cells, and that insulin causes those fat cells to stop releasing fat. So now you've got a, a drop in fat in the in, in your circulation, and then the, the pancreatic cells um, uh, shut off producing insulin, and that starts the whole cycle up again. So it's kind of like hmm. the third method of homeostasis, of the, the third glucose homeostasis. Um, but I, I prefer, personally, I prefer to use the high fat method um, yeah. and uh, let my liver produce all the glucose. Well, I would love to interview somebody who has done this potato diet because I want to know things like, how hungry are you? It seems like yeah. it seems like that would make you hungry all the time. And, mm. and I don't know. Or nauseous. But, Maybe nauseous yeah. all the time. <laughs> or yeah. bored, at least. You know? well, I don't know. There, there was that rice diet in the 40s, which um, was the, the Kempener rice diet. Hmm. And there was uh, it was interesting because the... There was a, a court case that happened after this. The, the diet was very famous, and it, it it got people from being diabetic to no longer being diabetic. And so, mm. and it was as much rice and as much fruit as you can eat, and nothing else. Wow. Uh, but the interesting thing was, it was such a horrible diet. There was a court case that happened, and during deposition, Walter Kemp Kempener, the guy who came up with this diet, admitted that um, that he used to whip. Patients, but they asked for it. They wanted what? him to whip them, bull whip them. What? So yeah, literally to keep them compliant to the diet because they really wanted to go off and eat some. So he'd get his whip out, and and so you know that's uh, you know if you, if you like a bit of S and M with your diet, then uh, <laughs> then, then the Kempner Rice diet might might be the one for you. <laughs> Well, I think the M definitely, maybe not the S, but <laughs> yeah. the masochism for sure. I well, know. anyway, so that's that's that. Uh, <laughs> that's that. And you know, the the second piece of mail leads into our topic for today. So this is actually a post that I put out there, and I wanted Jason Fung to chime in on it because, you know, he's Mister Fasting. Yeah. Um, but he he didn't get around to doing that uh, yet, anyway. But we did have some great replies. So here's what I wrote. Um, Jason Fung, are there any studies that you know of that explain why we don't experience vitamin deficiencies when fasted? Mm. Isn't scurvy caused by a lack of vitamin C? Yeah. And vitamin C is water soluble. And the B complex, all the B vitamins are also water soluble. Sure. So my question is, does the body somehow store them in body fat? For that matter, do we even need them when fasted? And so, you know, this brings up a, a, a lot of good questions. First of all, I suspected that, and, and I have no proof of this, but I suspect that but fat-soluble vitamins are probably stored in body fat. Yeah, we know cholesterol is and a lot of other lipids, yeah. uh, a lot of other lipid-based molecules are, so yeah. Right, but then vitamin C and the B-complex vitamins are particularly important and they are not stored in body fat, or, or at least... I don't know. Are they? Yeah. How can no, they be? They're, they're, they're mostly stored in cells, as I understand it, stored and drawn in down. In muscle. In cells. Yeah, muscle and in the brain. So we had one response from Gabor who says that, I believe that hypovitaminosis, which is um, chronic- uh, Lack of vitamins. Deficit of vitamins, yeah, is only a concern of extended fasting. You won't deplete vitamins in three or four days. Um, another aspect to consider is that vitamin C demand is profoundly decreased with reduced blood sugar levels and yeah. also during at autophagy. Which is? Uh, autophagy is the, during fasting the breakdown of, uh, of proteins. So um, mm. the uh, vitamin C is mainly essential for anabolic processes, which is the building up of uh, uh, the building up, not the breaking down of, uh, of proteins. So okay. the interesting thing about that is that both vitamin C 
and glucose take the same path into cells. And so you can imagine it's a little bit like a, if you had a football game and you had the home supporters and the away supporters and the home supporters, there's a thousand home supporters and there's only 10 away supporters. Mm. If they're all, go, if they're all having to go through the same turnstile and you only get a hundred people into the game before, into the, sta- the stadium before it's filled, then you're likely to only have one guy from the away team mm. because of the ratio of people coming in the door. So it sort of means that if you have a lot of glucose running in your, around in your blood, you need to eat a lot more vitamin C just to get a little bit into your cells. Interesting. Because they're competing to get through the same door. Most mammals make uh, uh, vitamin C. It's part of the glucose chain. So really, they make yeah, they make it out of glucose. The reason that we don't make it out of glucose um, is interesting. Now, I I believe that some of it has to do with the fact that that our ancestors evolved around the equator where there was a lot of fruit and we were tree dwelling. Monkeys, so primates. Mm. The only the only mammals that don't really make uh, vitamin C are primates, and I think hamsters may not make it as well. <laughs> so, but all other mammals make it as in all of their cells, so they don't have a problem with it. It's not a vitamin for them, wow. but it's a it is a it is an essential vitamin for us. It's one of the reasons why that we're we're able to see the color red. Most most animals don't really pick up red very well, but we pick really? up really well because ripe fruit is red. Wow. Isn't that interesting? And speaking of this, I had another interaction with my mother via email. And you know my mother, right? I talked about her, right? Yes. Yeah. So um, I told her that I was beginning to get a little, you know, nose head cold. Okay. And I typically get a head cold around this time of year when the seasons change Mm. and it lasts about four or five days and it goes away, right? So this is no big deal for me. Yeah. And, um, And she says... You know, make sure that you take an all list of vitamins and stuff, which are in my multivitamin. And then she says in all caps, eat fruit, (laughs) exclamation marks, you know, four. And then I said to her, you have some nerve telling a diabetic to eat fruit. And she (laughs) says, she says, I think that you could be able to tolerate in half an apple or a half a banana with, and I said, no, uh, I've done the tests. Yeah. One bite of banana is enough to spike my blood sugar and raise my insulin and knock and me turn out of you into a cookie monster. <laughs> yeah. And then she, and her response was, wow, I had no idea. So mm. clearly people are just, they don't understand that diabetics cannot eat fruit. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, well most fruit is just uh, a, a bag of sugar water. You know, there, yeah. there are some nutrient, there are some phytonutrients in fruit. Um, and the, the, the fruit's job, when you think about it, the fruit's job is to trick you into eating their seeds and defecating them out. Right. So that the seeds get to start off in some nice, uh, manure. Fertilizer. Fertilizer, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so their job is to try and trick you into eating it. So it's a trap, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it is true. All right. So, um, some more responses here. Cheryl says, when you feast, ensure to eat food high in vitamin C, like bell peppers, kale, broccoli, and berries. Uh, I only eat blackberries and raspberries in about seven or eight. I also take a really good multivitamin every day and vitamin D3 too. Yeah. All I got to say about that is, um, I think the consensus on this thread is why mess around, take a multivitamin if you fast. Yeah. Um, and for obvious reasons. Yeah, I take a multivitamin every day because, you know, uh, what if I'm missing something? At right. least it's, it's, like a, it's like a safety net just in case. Right. But, you know, I agree with, it. I agree with Cheryl that uh, bell peppers are awesome. I'm, these days I'm adding bell peppers probably into one in every two meals. Wow. And it's not a lot. It, you don't need to eat a lot of uh, a pepper, maybe, I, maybe a small capsicum or bell pepper um, in a meal between the two of us once every two days. So it's not a lot of um, of pepper, but it is just enough just to keep vitamin C uh, topped up. So uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I uh, and I also agree. Blackberries, we get we we forage for blackberries here in February, and yeah. we fill our freezer with uh, blackberries in freezer bags. And through the rest of the year, we're just eating blackberries that we've sort of uh, we've captured at their perfect ripeness. Mm. So that's awesome. And Cheryl goes on to say, the toxicity of vitamin C may seem alarming, but it is relatively rare, except in cases when individuals are deliberately taking mega doses of the vitamin because the body can't store vitamin C. Well, but we said earlier that it it is stored, there's a little bit in muscles and in the brain. Yeah. 
and we know that. That's right. But there's not. It's not a whole lot of it, right, apparently, right? No, we don't have. We don't have. We don't have a large storage reservoir of it. Right. But basically, it diffuses into all of our cells. It goes across the the, the glute transporters the same way as, as glucose, and okay. uh, and so all of our cells uh, will have to get it from circulation because none of them mm. are able to make it. But if you have a vitamin C deficiency, and really that's an interesting idea for a ketogenic mm. person, typically, because as you said before, and we'll post the science to prove this, Yeah. because and we'll, the science to prove this, when your glucose is high, you yeah. need more vitamin C as an antioxidant to yeah. combat the sort of the... Uh, in fact, you can have uh, atherosclerosis develop because you don't have enough vitamin C to combat what's going on with the high glucose. Yeah. So right. it's better to take constant small doses of vitamin C because it only lasts for 30 minutes or so instead yeah. of taking a mega dose like a thousand milligrams per day in the morning. Yeah. If you're going to eat a thousand milligrams, it's better to take a hundred ten times a day. And it, the the interesting thing that I learned today from Dr. Finney was, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be yeah you're on cloud nine, dude. I'm gonna be name dropping Dr. Finney all day. Uh, <laughs> so the, another interesting th thing that I learned from Dr. Finney today was that the, uh, and I've heard him say this before, but it reminded me that beta hydroxybutyrate is a much cleaner form of energy than glucose because it produces less free radicals and. You can think of it as a free radical is like uh, smog coming out of the engine of your car and, right. and beta hydroxybutyrate is like running an electric car. There ain't no smog. Mm. So because there's smog coming out of a car that's running on glucose, you need more of the antioxidants to clean it up. Yeah. So so you need you not only need a lot of vitamin C just to compete with glucose to get into the cell, but you also need a lot more in the cell because it's got more free radicals to uh, to, to mop up. Right. Yeah, so Raymond also says that B vitamins can be very important and are often the issue of why people crash out of a fast after seven days. Uh, Interesting. He, he says that it's likely that vitamin C becomes less of an issue and people seem to have very little issue with it. Glucose goes low and uric acid goes high in relation, and high uric acid is possibly doing some of the things that vitamin C does in regards to antioxidant. Wow. He also says it still may be useful to take some vitamin C while fasting past seven days. So, you know, as you say, a multivitamin is going to cover a lot of these. So Raymond goes on to say that if you deplete of B vitamins, and you probably will fairly early on, uh, many energy pathways become compromised and you will have issues that people put down to electrolytes or detox or stress huh. uh, these are these are the things people often often feel during a during a fast and so it may be just depletion of B vitamins during that. So he suggests that most likely all you need is a B complex supplement, but a good one. He suggests that uh, when he's on a longer fast over seven days, that uh, he says your heart rate is staying over 100. You feel fatigued and stressed, muscles are cramping. It will tend to be that you ran out of uh, especially some of the B vitamins. So that's a fairly dangerous state to be in when uh, muscles are cramping and that your heart is fatigued. Um, so um, he suggests, uh, yeah, a B complex. So that might be a reasonable thing to to add into your your uh, supplements during a fasting. Huh? Yeah. One interesting thing with uh, B vitamins, especially for diabetics that are on metformin, is B twelve uh, can be very important. Right. And the B vitamins are, are all mainly for the process of uh, converting energy inside your cells. So mm. um, the um, B twelve in particular. Uh, is depleted when uh, people take metformin. And so you really want to hmm. make sure that you get, if you're on metformin, uh, ask your doctor next time you do your blood tests to get a B12 uh, status. Yeah, and you really want your B12 to be between 600 and 2000. So uh, the standard range is anything above 127 is considered okay. But um, you really want a fairly high B12. Uh, I'll link a an article from uh, Guyan Belanga who uh, sent me a, 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 a blog post about B12 and he goes into a lot of detail about why your life really could depend on B12. And one thing I'm going to do when I next see my doctor is ask her to give me an injection of cobalamine, which is uh, basically vitamin B12. Hmm. It, it lasts for like three, th uh, three months. So it's something that uh, you may not be able to supplement directly. You, uh, talk to your doctor about it. But uh, as I say, we will link this uh, article about uh, B12 uh, in the show notes. Hmm. Okay. 
What's the deal with fish oil? Yeah, so Dr. Finney said something interesting today. <laughs> <laughs> no, so he, somebody asked a question from the audience about uh, supplementing omega-3 versus omega-6 oils. Right. And his comment was that they, they compete um, – with each other. And so it's very difficult to be deficient in omega 6s because all of our sources of meat have omega 6s because we feed a lot of our animals grains. Um, basically, grains produce a lot of omega 6s. And so any animals that are in the oceanic food chain uh, will probably have higher levels of omega 3s in them. So, fish, for yeah. example, deep ocean fish mm -hmm. um, and crustacea, the, these are all great sources of omega 3. So, he said, that you you don't need very much uh, polyunsaturated fat in your diet. You need pr a, probably a couple of grams a, of each, six and three, and we use these to make our cell walls. So these are very important for for uh, transiting um, uh, things through our cell uh, across our cell membranes. So um, it's it's very important to not have oxidized. Um, uh, polyunsaturated and one of the interesting things about polyunsaturated fats is because they're called polyunsaturated because they have a lot of double chains right. and those double chains can be split and oxidized very easily yeah. and so these oils they're mostly from plants mm. and most of the animal sources of oils or fats fat and oil are the same thing except one's liquid at room temperature so right, right. One, one most of the animal sources because animals run at a higher temperature than the background uh, saturated fats um, uh, remain liquid and so uh, we can use saturated fats which are a lot of safer form of, uh, of fat because they have no double bonds and so they're very, very difficult. Mm. They have longer shelf life that it's very difficult to oxidize them. So one of the things about uh, these uh, fats, if, you have, if you're supplementing polyunsaturated fats, you want to make sure that you don't have a rancid fat. So if you're buying fish oil capsules to uh, supplement with because you're not eating regular sources of fish, which would be a better source of omega threes, right? If you if you're buying capsules, crack one open and smell it, and if it smells off, then it's probably rancid, and you don't want to go with that brand. But doesn't fish smell fishy? I mean, how can you tell a fresh fish smell from a rancid have, fish smell? Have you ever smelt rancid butter? The difference between rancid yeah. butter and fresh butter, it's that its yeah. that smell that you're looking for. So oh, I, wow. I just crack one open and just what – you, what you're looking for is if this brand has good quality control, if their use-by dates are reasonable. I mean, some of these uh, manufacturers have use-by dates sort of multiple years into the future so that they can keep their product on the shelves for longer. And people just yeah. people just don't, aren't aware of, of this. It's, it's almost worthwhile throwing away a batch because you're probably going to be supplementing a – if, you, if you're not eating fish, you're probably going to be supplementing with a capsule every day uh, for the rest of your life. Find a brand that you trust. Um, every now and then, crack one open and check it just to make sure that it's still, it's still non-rancid. Because the problem yeah. is, if you take in a polyunsaturated fat that is rancid and you then use it for your cell walls, your cell walls then have a structural a problem with structural integrity. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's vitally important. So, yeah. Okay. So I would suggest the best thing is to eat fish on a regular basis. I try and eat fish at least once a week. Dr. Finney suggests eat it three times a week. That might be a bit mm. difficult, but uh, if you're not going to, then take a fish oil capsule every day and check your brand, uh, smell it. If it smells off, then, then it's probably rancid and you probably don't want to go with that brand. So there are a couple other oils that fall into this omega-3 category, flaxseed oil. Yeah. And krill oil. Yeah. Yeah, so krill oil is uh, pretty much the same as fish oil. Uh, it's uh, slightly higher in DHA, I believe. There's another form, actually, we just found out on our group. Somebody has algae oil. Hmm. And algae oil is it's like 90% uh, monounsaturated. It's like 0.5% saturated. And it's very difficult. And that, that's the only information they want to tell you about. But in fact, the difference there is... Polyunsaturated and it's all omega three. So that they've, they've basically buried the lead by talking about the fact that our oil is one, so wonderful because it has no no saturated fat. No, the benefit of this is that it's got these high omega threes. So I would be tempted just to have that a, a teaspoon of that once a day as a supplement. I wouldn't use it for cooking because you don't want to oxidize it, and I probably mm. wouldn't use it for mayonnaise or anything like that. But 
you know, it's about this time in a conversation like this where my BS detector goes up, you know, the little hairs <laughs> on my neck stand up. And I yeah. think, you know, what did early humans do without supplements? You know, yeah. I, there's got to be natural sources of this stuff that either we're just missing in our diet um, for some reason or that we over prescribe supplements because they're products, right? And yeah, then I so somebody gets behind these things and finds some little benefit, um, you know, whereas the body could most likely adapt to. But you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I just, I, I, I just over supplementing just seems to me to be naturally not a good idea. Yeah, I, th I, I mean, just, and that's why we got to. That's why we got to unravel this and unpack these stories of, and find yeah. out the real science behind it. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. I th I think that uh, eating eating shellfish like mussels and oysters are something that historically there was a, a mussel bay in uh, South Africa. There was at one point there were only about a hundred human beings on the planet, and they're all uh, at this one location, and that's what they were living on. Um, yeah. So you know that uh, uh, I suspect that uh, ancestrally we had a high amount of shellfish, a high amount of uh, opp opportunistic fish. Yeah, but that's only for people that lived on the coast. When they migrated inland, yeah, there was no more shellfish. The body adapted somehow. Yeah, it must have. Uh, yeah, I d I'm, I'm not sure. I I, I suspect that uh, maybe there were trading routes. I know that the the Inuit had trading routes where they used to trade ulluk and grease um, uh, yeah. and other kinds of uh, dried fish and uh, and dried seal and what have you uh, mm. inland for very long distances. So uh, wow. yeah, but I suspect that people. I suspect human beings really have been uh, living along the oceans. Maybe that might be an Australian point of view because ninety nine point nine of all Australians live very close to the ocean. Yeah. All right. Well, there's a lot more we could talk about in terms of supplements, but in general, kids, there are fat soluble vitamins, which are most of them. There are water soluble vitamins, the B vitamins, the vitamin C. Apparently you don't need a whole lot of more vitamin C uh, when you're ketogenic or fasting, but just to be safe, get those minerals, get your uh, electrolytes, Get your B complex. Take a multivitamin if you're fasting. I think that's pretty much. Even Doctor Fung says, take a multivitamin. Why risk it? Yeah. No, I totally agree with that. Yeah, and uh, make sure you get a good source of krill oil or fish oil, and uh, or just eat more fish if you can verify that it's not polluted. <laughs> uh, yeah, and and during this during the winter time when the sun is low. Get a supplement with vitamin D, and during the summertime, oh, yeah. make sure you get like ten to fifteen minutes of sun a day. Skin, sun on skin turns cholesterol into vitamin D. Your body, your skin, the top level of your skin turns cholesterol into vitamin D. That is one vitamin that most of us are deficient in. In our yeah. modern society, we spend a lot more time indoors. Yeah. And uh, I had a serious vitamin D deficiency to the point where my doctor said take four thousand. Yeah, units. Julie's the same. She Julie's been told to take four thousand units, and she, she goes out. She goes out with long sleeves. With uh, uh, yeah. she has uh, suntan cream on her face all the time and a hat on. So that's one of the things in Australia mm. is that we have such a high prevalence of melanomas that uh, we tend yeah. to be a little bit paranoid about these things. But just ten minutes of sun is not enough to to do damage, uh, deep damage uh, that uh, could cause cancer, but is enough to just activate uh, the top levels of your skin to to convert um, uh, cholesterol into vitamin D. So I would suggest Interesting. that. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we could go on and on, but yeah. let's let's not talk about. <laughs> Recipes. Recipes. <laughs> <laughs> Recipes. 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 So I've got a good one today. I've got coconut chocolate bars. Now these wow. are these are I guess you could call them uh, coconut logs. Uh, yeah. In Europe, in Europe, they're called coconut logs. There is an Atkins bar. I've got a link in the show notes to the recipe for actually making these, and it's got a picture of the Atkins bar. It's not a very good picture, so I apologise for that. The method of this recipe, I found an ice block mold for a soda stream that makes makes cylindrical ice blocks, and they're meant to fit into the top of the bottle of a soda stream. Okay, but they work absolutely perfectly for forming a cylinder to make a sweet treat. So basically, what mm. I do is I 
I'm going to make, uh, I'm going to cook up some coconut cream, some coconut oil, some vanilla, and I'm going to simmer it gently until it's all combined. And so basically it's a lot of coconut fat, uh, essentially. Yeah. Um, and uh, the flavors of coconut and the flavors of vanilla. So the ingredients for this are 80 mils of coconut cream and 20 grams of coconut oil. And I'm going to simmer this with a little bit of vanilla gently until it's combined and then I take it off the heat and I add a sweetener to taste. You don't have to add a sweetener because these um, coconut and vanilla have slightly sweet flavors, so you don't really need mm. a sweetener. But I generally use uh, sucralose. Uh, I use pure sucralose, but these days uh, uh, Splenda has sucralose in it. It's, it also mm-hmm. has more carbs because it uses a carb. It yeah. uses dextrose as a filler. Uh, but these days right. Splenda actually makes a smaller tablet, which is uh, about a tenth of the size of the old tablet. So I'm starting starting to go more towards using it just for convenience. So anyway, um, so you're going to sweeten this mixture and then I add some coconut flour and it's about uh, a tablespoon of coconut flour and I'm also going to add some desiccated coconut, about 60 grams of desiccated coconut and uh, and so I add that to this mix and it basically starts to thicken up and then I can start to form it in the ice block mould and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to freeze that ice block, these cylinders of coconutty sweetness. Mm. And then once they're fro- – I put a weight on it in the freezer. And then once they're frozen, I break them all apart and dip them into melted chocolate. Now, I use tempered chocolate because it gives you that crack and it makes it so that it it doesn't melt in your hand. It does melt, melt in your mouth. But you don't have to do yeah. that. If you can't be bothered – uh, if you can't wait for the, the hassle yeah. of tempering your chocolate, just any old melted yeah. chocolate will do the job. It's about half the size of the Atkins bar and about half the calories mm-hmm. and uh, about half of the uh, carb load. And, of course, because it's all made from raw ingredients, there's no uh, um, sugar alcohols or anything else funky in there that you've added in. Right. Um, of course, if you know, I had Splenda, I guess you could say that that's a, a funky chemical that uh, mm-hmm. it doesn't have much of an effect on me. So I use those. Uh, these are little fat bombs. Um, yep. You know, I might have this sort of uh, once a week. I might have uh, have one of these with a coffee or something as a treat. Mm. Um, and they they last. They st- they store for a very long time in the fridge, um, as long as you don't keep raiding the fridge for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very cool. So that's my recipe. Sounds delicious, Richard. So what have you got, Carl? So um, one of my favorite dishes that I used to eat a lot when mm-hmm. I go to an Italian restaurant that I like on Federal Hill in Providence, Rhode Island, okay. uh, is uh, the Italian section. Yeah. And uh, this is cassoulet. Cassoulet. Oh, yeah. And a cassoulet is a classic French dish. Mm-hmm. It's usually... Uh, consistent. It's sort of like chili, except that it doesn't have the chili flavor, but it's a combination of white beans and a variety of meats. Flagellate beans often, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can use whatever beans you like. Um, the lower carb, the better. And if you want to omit the beans, oh, who's going to argue, right? Yeah. But I would, if it calls for a cup of beans, which this one does, you could use a half a cup or you could use something like the black soybeans that I already right. yeah. talked about. Yeah. But, uh, you know, maybe some chickpeas instead, a little bit lower carb. Yeah. But the meats are typically sausage, pork, duck confit, lamb, goose, you know. (laughs) These are the kinds of things that you just put put together and typically simmer in a Dutch oven for hours and hours. But you can do it in a crock pot as well. This is what I love about just basic recipes is that... Mm. You you know when you when you know how things go together, it's really just all about figuring out combinations, and yeah. then you can experiment with how to cook them and how to how to serve them. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, with it, probably uh, two years ago, or maybe three years ago, I was pretty ordinary at cooking, but it was just the process of trying these things out. Does this work with that? And you know, over about three years, I think I do okay now. You know, I do some decent recipes. Yeah. But, but and, and, you know, tonight I just put something together just from things, looked in the fridge, what can I, I'll, I'll have a bit of this, bit of this, bit of that. Yep. You know, bang, done. So Right. So, so this cassoulet. Yeah, the cassoulet. So here is just one recipe that I'm going to link on the show notes 
um, don't take this as the ultimate, but let's just talk about the flavors and the flavors that are in here. So you've right. got a cup of beans, mm. whatever beans that yeah. you want. Um, and we talked about that. So this is for six servings, right? Yeah, six yeah. servings. Yeah. You got 12 ounces of lamb stew meat cut mm. into one inch cubes. You got a tablespoon of olive oil, got two cups of broth, right? which we've talked about beef Any broth, kind of stock, you know, yeah. it, you mm -hmm. could use chicken stock yeah. too. You could use your bone broth, whatever you like. Mm -hmm. Eight ounces of cooked kielbasa. Now, what's mm -hmm. great about kielbasa is it's got that smoked flavor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? So kielbasa is definitely in. You're going to use a, a tablespoon, at least a tablespoon of snipped fresh thyme. Thyme goes really, really well with meats and especially lamb, beef, and pork. Uh, it's just one of those herbs that brings out the flavors. And it's really hard to kill too, the plant. So it's really easy yeah. to grow some thyme really in the backyard. We've got some lemon thyme in the house. And I, I just can't kill it. I kill everything else, but not the thyme. <laughs> yep. So uh, in terms of other meats that you can throw in there, this recipe doesn't have them per se, but I would go to my grocery store and get some duck confit. Oh, yeah. And chop that up into small pieces. That duck fat is going to just mm. turn to wonderful goodness. Um, I would... Avoid leaner cuts of meat, like pork tenderloin, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. I would, you know, if you're going to put pork in there, the kielbasa is a great way to get it. Or, um, you know, a pork butt, yeah. you might put some of that in there. Yeah. I would put, uh, if I was going to put beef in there, I'd probably use a chuck steak because that's got a lot of fat. Yeah. And uh, it's very, very tasty. Mm. Now, in terms of other spices, garlic. Yep. Three or four or five cloves of garlic <laughs> crushed or six. You yeah, know, I love yeah. garlic. Yeah, same. Maybe some whole black peppercorns or just some ground pepper. Mm -hmm. Definitely a bay leaf or two. Yeah. Now, this recipe calls for some veggies, a small eggplant peeled and chopped. Eggplant's nice because it has that wonderful texture yeah. that uh, stands up well to the meat. Yeah. Yeah. And sort of fills out the, the, the thickens the sauce, sure. right? And then some green peppers or uh, red pepper or whatever. Now, this recipe calls for a can of tomato paste. Eh, nah. I would, I would avoid that. Yeah. I would put in maybe, maybe a teaspoon, yeah, yeah, a tablespoon like of tomato yeah. paste and, or if you're Richard Morris and you make your own tomato sauce, throw a, yeah. cube, a nice cube of tomato sauce in there. Yeah, made some of that this weekend. Yeah. So in terms of cooking, uh, if you're going to do this in a in the oven in a Dutch oven or a casserole dish, yeah, probably a low temperature like 200 degrees or so Fahrenheit. Sure. For maybe eight to ten hours, you know, just yeah. put it in in the morning and then eat it for dinner. Yeah. Um, if you're going to cook it on a higher temperature, maybe four to five hours, but definitely low and slow to let all that goodness just mix mix together. Yeah, that sounds delicious. <laughs> it's a great winter recipe because yeah. it's hearty, you know, and when it's cold outside, it's a great. Uh, it's really a stew. Julie says it sticks to your belly like lead. <laughs> I don't yeah. quite know what that means, but it sounds good. <laughs> yep. So experiment. I would like to hear from you if you're going to do a cassoulet. What went mm. in it and how did it taste? Uh, you know, email us. And uh, speaking of emailing us, that's a show. Uh, of course, if you have anything that you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something you don't agree with, or some more research that you found to support or refute what we've said, send it by email to dudes at twoketodudes.com or post it on our website. And you can follow us on Twitter at 2 Keto Dudes, on Instagram at 2 Keto Dudes. And of course, if you want to join our Facebook community, it's fb.2keto.com. Yeah. Keep calm and keto on, my friend. Keep calm and keto on. All right. We'll see you next time on 2 Keto Dudes. Keto Dudes.